promises every single time. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Your way is the only way for me. It's a narrow road that leads to life, but I want to be on it. It's a narrow road, but the mercy is wide Cause you're good in your promise Sing it out now I'll take you at your word
God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven, you do just what you said. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness. Setting same, I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Oh, oh, Makes you age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove there's nothing you can't do, faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak. of God, but maybe you're wondering, man, how long, God, how long, how long do I pray 
for my son or my daughter? How long do I pray for my spouse? How long will this health situation go on and on? How long will I have this money problem? My message to you today, God's message to you today, hold on. Hold on. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting sun, I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall, but you have never. Fail me yet. Waiting for change to come, knowing the battle's won. For you have never failed. still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never failed me yet you never failed
Well, good morning, Rock Island. I hope that you are doing great. I am so glad that you are here. If we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Josh. I get to serve as one of the pastors here on staff at Heritage. And so I do want to welcome all of you in the room, but also those of you who are watching online, connecting from a distance, we're so glad that you're here as well. We're going to jump right into it today. Please turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1, and we're going to go through the whole thing again. Oh, no, no. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. But I do want to say a couple of things before we officially turn the page uh, from Revelation to the next series. I want to say a couple of things. One is I do want to just thank Pastor Brian for leading us through 13 weeks of a very difficult book. So thank you for the work. <clears throat> But then I'd like to add one last thing to the Revelation series. This will have been the only contribution that I will have made in the entire series. You'll find out pretty quickly why. This is a very Josh Howardy thing to say. But let me contribute something. I was talking with a retired missionary at my last church. I served at a church in Wheaton, Illinois, in Chicagoland before coming to Heritage. And I had just preached a message on the second coming of Jesus. I actually think it was a series like questions for God. And, you know, one of the questions that came in was, what is this? And so we just spent a Sunday talking about it. And I remember this retired missionary came up to me and he said, look, Josh, you know, people ask me all the time, like, are you premillennial? Are you postmillennial? Are you amillennial? And I, I tell them, look, I'm none of those things. I am pan-millennial. And of course they say, what does that mean? Tell us your theory, theory. Tell us all about it. And I simply say, look, it'll all pan out at the end. <laughs> and look, we, we can sort of laugh about that a little bit, but for whatever reason, that like dad joke, uh, end times dad joke, uh, has stuck with me over the years because when we are in the tribe of Jesus, we can hold out hope that one day Jesus will in fact return. He will set all things right. He will rise us up into new resurrection bodies. We will live and play and eat and lead and love and be present with the Trinity and other believers for all eternity. For Christ followers, it will all pan out at the end, regardless of what it looks like to get there, it will pan out at the end. Jesus will set everything right. And for that, I am so grateful. I am so grateful. Now, here's the deal. We engage with Revelation. Revelation is apocalyptic literature. It is intentionally cosmic by nature. It is a huge book. And I don't know about you, but for me, as I engage with Revelation at any time, really, not just this summer, I feel really small in light of the grandness of Revelation. And in a lot of ways, I feel really helpless in light of the grandness of Revelation. Maybe there's some intention to that. Maybe we should feel that as we engage with that type of literature. But we want to shift our attention, turn the page, so to speak, to a new series called Extraordinary Faith. But I want us to understand right up front that this is a series that is designed to help reorient us to our present moment 
to our present concerns, to our present situations, and to ask, what does it look like to cling to Jesus with extraordinary faith? Now, when you hear that title, extraordinary faith, I know some of your minds will probably be like, I know they're going to go talk about Moses and David and Abraham and, 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 and all of these world changers. They're, they're going to, you know, maybe even John on the island of Patmos. We're, you know, we're going to talk about all these guys and all, all, these, all these figures who did impossible things, who changed and shaped history. Surely that's where we're going to land in this series. And I want to stop here long enough to say this. Every single one of us in this room can live into extraordinary faith. Now, we're going to talk about that. We'll unpack that a little bit. But I think it's really easy for us to look around at the shape and, and sort of fabric of our lives. And we can easily dismiss ourselves as any sort of a faith hero. Or we can dismiss ourselves from someone who holds extraordinary faith in any regard. And what I want to challenge you to consider both today and in the next two weeks in this series, is that if you are a human being, if you have taken a breath in, in the last five seconds, you are stamped with the image of God. That means that your being is infused with divine substance that is granted by God to you to make you uniquely you, to make you uniquely and powerfully human, and to allow you to connect in relationship with the living God, even allowing you to contain the Holy Spirit of God because we're walking many temples of the Holy Spirit. I want you to latch onto that and hold that truth close to you today. Now, when we talk about the word faith, let's kind of get on the same page. Let's, let's look at the scriptures. One of the best definitions that the scriptures give us is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It states it like this, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Biblically speaking, faith is trust. Specifically, trusting that Jesus was who he said he was through the testament of the scriptures, but also trusting in his redemptive plan for our lives and for the entire world. It is faith because we are not at the end of the story as of yet. So we have to trust that Jesus is going to complete the story as promised. Well, we don't see it yet tangibly, but we hold out hope and we cling with trust and faith in the work and person of Jesus. That is biblical faith. Now, just so that there's no confusion, biblical faith also involves some sort of response on our end, some, some sort of action. You know, if you're in a cert, of a certain age and you grew up in a Protestant church, you probably sang an old hymn called Trust and Obey, right? Trust and obey. That's all I'm going to sing to you uh, today. But, but I think this hits what I'm trying to get at here, this trust and obey piece of things, that, that faith in Jesus is not passive faith. Faith in Jesus urges us forward, helping to bring God's future kingdom here and now in the present. And friends, if that sounds intimidating, please understand something. Every time you act in Christ like love, you are helping to bring God's future kingdom to the present. When you rock your baby to sleep, you are bringing God's future to the present. When you choose to forgive, you are living into future kingdom dynamics. When you wash your dishes, when you do your job well, when you decide to be present to a family member, when you write a get well card, whatever you do in Christ's love, whatever you do in the spirit of, of the fruit of the spirit, you are slowly and deliberately and sometimes even defiantly when we look at the world around us and the darkness that closes in, that we we are choosing to help bring God's future kingdom to earth in the here and the now. See, here's the deal. And if you're tracking in your notes, this is the start of all that. It's the first fill in. Extraordinary faith is made up of ordinary obedience. Extraordinary faith is made up of the stuff of ordinary obedience. This really is my thesis statement today. 
And in a lot of ways, it's, it's we're building a foundation for the rest of the series. Ordinary, everyday obedience actually builds into a life of extraordinary faith. And so for the rest of our time together, I'm going to try to prove this. And I'm going to give you a couple of angles to, to kind of tease it out a little bit. But really to do this, I'm going to give you three scriptural snapshots for your reflection. All of these snapshots come from the gospel of Matthew. And I, I want... I want you to begin to just think through this, and hopefully this will encourage your hearts, particularly as you consider your everyday decisions and actions and investments in light of your faith journey and relationship with Jesus. So scriptural snapshot number one, Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. Jesus speaking, and he says this, I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would go. Nothing would be impossible. Now listen, I think that Jesus often, when he teaches, he will use overstatement to make a point. And, and I, I think that he's doing that a little bit here. I, I don't think that he's literally calling us to hop on a plane to Nepal and go to Mount Everest and try to move Mount Everest with our mind or our voice or our faith, like a, a Star Wars moment. Like, I don't think he's looking for that. I, I think the imagery or the example that Jesus uses in this passage is not actually the point. I think the actual point sounds something like this, that a little faith can go a long, long way. I was listening to a podcast recently that, that gave an example around this. It, it just it fits right in with this. And the example given was to, to really consider a sailboat, a boat that only can move through the energy of wind. On a sailboat, you are at the mercy of the wind. You can't control the wind. You don't control timing or power or direction. You can't even see the wind. The only thing we control is that one small collaborative act of faith that every time we get in the boat, we put up the sail. And I like this because it illustrates what is true of every single one of us in the room. God provides the power. He provides the miracle. He provides the direction and the anointing and the transformation. God provides the very large majority of the thrust and movement of our faith but it still does require those small acts of us just showing up out of response to him, trusting that he can move. It does require that we put up that sail, a mustard seed act of faith. And so I wonder where in our lives do we need to demonstrate a mustard seed type of faith response? I mean, where in your life do you need God to show up? And maybe there's an area of your life where you've given up on it and you haven't put up the sail in that situation for years. And maybe God is asking you to show up again, to put up the sail and wait for him to move. That God wants to remind you that he can do the heavy lifting, but you need to continue to just show up in trust and hope and faith. Now there's another Snapshot, the second snapshot found in Matthew 13, specifically verses 31 and 32. Jesus is telling here a little bit of a mini parable, which is a, a story to illustrate a kingdom reality. And here's what Jesus says. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and planted in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it's grown, it's the largest of all vegetable plants. It becomes a tree so that the birds of the sky come and nest in its branches. Now again, this is just, I love Jesus as a storyteller. I, I love running into his parables. He just does such a great job. And this is a great and vivid illustration of how the kingdom works. And notice here, we even get a little bit more information on this mustard seed. This is two snapshots in a row that contain that imagery. The smallest of all seeds turns into the largest of all vegetable plants. This is a beautiful and powerful picture of how the kingdom works. And we've already established today that a little bit can go a long way, 
But this second snapshot doubles down on that and gives us another way to think about this. Ongoing, ordinary obedience leads to a powerful legacy. Ongoing, ordinary obedience builds and builds into something just beautiful. But it starts with just showing up again and again and again, putting the sail up to catch the wind of God again and again and again, acting in love over and over. All of those small mustard seed types of trust will accumulate over time and turn into a vegetable tree type legacy. Now, allow me uh, to go off the rails for a minute. If you've heard me communicate, you know I'll do this occasionally, and I trust that, that, that you'll trust me, that I'll get us back on the rails. But I, I grew up loving the game of tennis. I played it in high school. I watched it. I loved it. I know I don't, I don't look the part. I'm more football ready than I'm actually just injury ready at this point uh, than tennis ready. But, but I loved tennis. And what really first captured my attention in tennis was a professional tennis player by the name of Andre Agassi. He was really famous when I was a kid. He played in the late 80s, the, the 90s, the early aughts. He, I just, I loved watching him play for whatever reason. And I remember, I have very specific heritage memories actually of when, when Agassi would make the French Open or Wimbledon finals, uh, they usually play those on Sundays and because of the time change, they play them on Sunday morning. And I remember skipping church in the old red brick building, going upstairs and finding a classroom with the TV and, and just watching it. Don't tell my parents, uh, this is just between you and me. But, but I loved Agassi, I love watching him play. So when he retired, he came out with an autobiography and I just devoured this thing. And, and it has a paragraph in it, I think it's actually early in the book, but it has a paragraph in it that has just stuck with me over the years. And, and it resonates so strongly with what we're talking about here with the second snapshot. So I want to share it with you. It's not going to be on the screen or anything. And I want to share it with one caveat. I have no idea where Andre Agassi stands on Christianity. So just understand that. But I love this paragraph and how it fits with what we're talking about. He writes this. He says, it's no accident, I think, that tennis uses the language of life, advantage, service, fault, break, love. The basic elements of tennis are those of everyday existence because every match is a life in miniature. Even the structure of tennis, the way the pieces fit inside one another like rushing nesting dolls, mimics the structure of our days. Points become games, become sets, become tournaments. And it's all so tightly connected that any point can become a turning point. It reminds me of the way seconds become minutes, become hours. And he, he ends his thought there, but I continue. Hours become days, become weeks, become years, become lifetimes. It's very mustard seed turned vegetable tree type stuff here. Showing up with just a small amount of faith, doing the next right thing, and then the next right thing and then put thousands and thousands of those next right things together and you have a masterpiece of a life. I've had the opportunity in 25 years of pastoral work to do many, you know, to officiate and work with families for many, many funerals. And I am often in dialogue with families pre-funeral, just kind of talking about their loved ones, trying to capture who they were, how did they live, how did they love, and I always marvel, I always marvel at those certain people that come through who have just allowed the momentum of their everyday decisions to build and build and build. And then at the end, their family can say, what a legacy they have left us. That this person loved us so incredibly well, lived their life so incredibly well, and they leave this vegetable tree type of legacy behind. It's interesting, uh, recently I was hearing somebody kind of talk about life and I think the context for this conversation was more uh, when you're in struggle and there's, there's different kind of angles that we look at our life and we try to work through life stuff and sometimes we'll, we'll look up, we'll look for strength from God, that's something we should do all the time. Sometimes we look back 
You know, we try to find out past mistakes and how we can learn from them or world history and, and how we can kind of help shape maybe something different. Or sometimes we'll look forward. We'll, we'll try to figure out, like, discern where does God want me to go and what, how do I leverage my future to try to imagine a brighter future. Sometimes we'll look around us and we'll see who's on the journey with us as we go. All of those things are good, beautiful things to do, but this person said that we often forget to do one simple thing, and that's just to simply look down and see where our feet are currently planted and to understand that this current moment is the only moment we really have. So how do we make the most of the life that is currently right under our feet? How can we be faithful with the mustard seed of this present moment? Who is right in front of us that we need to pay attention to? What is right in front of us that we need to pay attention to? These are such good questions to wrestle with, and I hope that you place them before the Lord and ask him to give input on those things. But there, all of this kind of leads to one final scriptural snapshot that I want to invite you to reflect on today. And before I give it to you, let me just give you a little bit of context. But last spring, I was reading through the Gospels very slowly, like uh, the way that I was kind of going about this was I was reading sections of like eight to 10 verses every morning, but I was reading those verses two or three times just to allow it to seep in. I was going very, very slow. And I came across the Last Supper passage in Matthew, and I'm convinced that this only happened because I was going slow. But there was a line that started kind of flashing lights within my soul for the first time ever, admittedly. I had just skipped over this particular line for years, had not paid any attention to it. And this was the first time that it caught my attention. I want to read you two verses, and then I'm going to kind of clue you in on what the Lord did in that moment for me. Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 and 18. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal for you? And Jesus told them, as you go into the city, you will see a certain man. Tell him, the teacher says, my time has come, and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. Here's the line that captured my attention for the first time ever. You will see a certain man. A certain man who was faithful to Jesus and his disciples in that moment. A certain man who was hospitable to Jesus that helped create space to share some really intimate and important final moments together. In fact, those final moments are so important to us as believers that we've turned it into one of our sacraments, that we receive and reenact this moment again and again through the Lord's Supper. So I was curious, and I, I looked a little bit more into this situation, and I discovered that the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke all contain this similar language. A certain man provided a home, space, hospitality. This man is never named. We don't know who he was. All we really know is that he said yes to hosting Jesus. And this just started to capture my soul. Because I think that this certain man resembles about 99.999% of all Christians who have ever lived throughout history. People through history who make small yet important decisions to say yes to Jesus, we don't know their names. They aren't famous. They aren't known to history. And yet every faithful decision they made has added to the historical current of Christianity continuing to survive and go from generation to generation to generation. And it struck me, and I firmly believe that this was something the Lord needed me to understand in the moment that I received it, and I pass it along to you for your reflection. Hidden obedience is just as important as visible obedience. Unseen obedience is just as important as visible obedience. Now look, I know you, you go around the room, every single one of us has examples of how we're obedient 
in private, unseen examples. Maybe, maybe it's just something in your family that's going on or, or the, the way that you serve at church or maybe the, maybe the type of job that you have. It's just you're, you're doing unseen works of obedience a lot. But just as an example and just hopefully so it, it kind of brings this home a little bit. I, I've been talking with Pastor Stephanie and Pastor Michaela and even conversations with some of you where I've become more and more aware that we have a small group of people at Heritage who are caretakers, people who are tending to the needs of a family member who can no longer take care of themselves for whatever reason. And I just, I consider, like, this type of caretaking work is hidden obedience type of work. And yet, friends, every single act of caretaking is seen by God. And your decision, and look, I I, I don't know how much stronger I can say this, and you you may not believe me, um, but, but try it too. But your decision to love your family member in private will be met with the same response from the Lord that Billy Graham will receive for his very public ministry. The Lord will look at you and him and say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Most of our work as believers will be hidden work. That's why it's so important. And I want you to know that you can be a certain woman or a certain man who decides to say yes to Jesus over and over and over again. Now, I I know this because I do it, but I've talked with enough of you to know that you do this as well, but we can... We can kind of play a game in our head that's not healthy. The, the comparison game or the if only game. We can, we can kind of say something like, if only my faith were more like, insert this person's name. If only I understood the scriptures more like this person. Or if only I had the skill set or gift mix like this person. If only I had the same opportunities afforded to me as this person has had. And friends, I think it's in those moments where we just need to take a breath in the presence of the Lord, and to firmly trust that God can use us in our current circumstances. God can use you in your current circumstance with your current skill set, whether it is hidden or visible work. And I want you to just know that God sees you and God loves you. I think the deepest expressions of faith are more often found in the quiet, hidden moments of life, maybe when life is pressing in and things are kind of difficult, when we are faithful at living out again and again the fruit of the Spirit, even when no credit is given, even when our faithful contributions don't lead to celebrity or praise or visibility, we just remain faithful. Or to steal a phrase from Eugene Peterson, one of my favorite phrases from him, that we can live into a long obedience in the same direction. Now, I asked at the very beginning of the sermon, what does it look like to cling to extraordinary faith in Jesus? And I hope I've made the case that extraordinary faith is made up of the stuff of ordinary obedience. It's looking down at our feet to see where our lives are currently planted and then making that small mustard seed decision of faith to put up the sail and wait for the wind of God to move. And we do this whether we are hidden or visible because with God, he sees it all and he's so incredibly proud of each of you for every single act of faith and faithfulness that you display in your life, whether hidden or visible. So I wanna close this in prayer. And those of you who know me well, you're not gonna be surprised to hear that I found a prayer for us. It's from a prayer resource called Every Moment Holy. I've actually used this resource before here at Heritage. And I I wanna just pray this over us uh, in this moment. And it's a prayer that really just sort of uh, brings all of these things together in a very beautiful way. And I'm just going to ask, would you receive this as a gift like it's intended for it to be? And so I'm going to just invite us to just put our attention on the Lord and let's pray together. 
Many are the things that must be daily done. Meet me therefore, O Lord, in the doing of the small repetitive tasks, in the cleaning and ordering and maintenance and stewardship of things, that by such stewardship I might bring a greater order to my own life and to the lives of any that I am given to serve, so that in those ordered spaces bright things might flourish, fellowship and companionship, creativity and conversation, learning and laughter, enjoyment and health. And as I steward the small daily tasks, may I remember these good ends and so discover in my labors the promise of the eternal hopes that underlie them all. High King of heaven, hmm. you showed yourself among us as the servant of all, speaking stories of a kingdom to come, a kingdom in which those who spend themselves for love, even in the humblest of services, will not be forgotten, but whose every service lovingly rendered will be seen from that far vantage as the planting of a precious seed blooming into eternity. And so I offer this small service to you, O Lord, for you make no distinction between those acts that bring a person the wide praise of his peers and those unmarked acts that are accomplished in quiet obedience without accolade. You see instead the heart, the love, and the faithful stewardship of all labors, great and small. O oh God, grant that my heart might be ordered aright, knowing that all good service faithfully rendered is first a service rendered unto you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. See things like you do, God, I look to you.
Hey friends, this is Senior Pastor Brian Savage, and I want to thank you so much for joining us at our Heritage at Home TV broadcast. Hey, we would love to know that you were watching today. At the bottom of your screen, you're going to see a link to a QR code where you can fill out a Connect card. We would love to get to know who you are, and we would really like to be praying for you. So I hope you would consider going to that link. Also, if you would like to support the ministries of Heritage Church, you'll also see a link at the bottom of your screen where you can give back to God and support the ministries. Friends, I want to thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Go in peace. i mm-hmm.